Hi, this is Colleen Dipple. I'm the founder and CEO of Families Empowered here with you on a second day in a row. Very excited to be here with you today. Um, and we've got an amazing guest, um, Dr. Raphael, who is at Texas Children's Hospital and also teaches at the Baylor College of Medicine. Is that correct, Dr. Mm -hmm. Raphael? Um, he's got an incredible um, resume, and I'm not going to read it all, but he is a certified pediatrician. Um, he has, uh, his interests are, well, um, I was going to say transcranial Doppler screenings in sickle cell populations. And <laughs> he's got very long, you know, PhDs and MDs, um, but generally speaking, he's a child health Sorry. Sorry. Oh my gosh. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. Thank you. So I uh, was introducing Dr. Raphael. Um, Families Empowered, we normally spend most of our time connecting parents to schools and schools to, to parents. We serve about 90,000 uh, families across Texas. Um, and the COVID crisis um, has been just stunning um, and devastating and um, we have closed schools across the country and as schools start to consider reopening we're hearing from thousands of families um, weekly about their concerns and most of their concerns are related to health and whether or not their children will be safe. And so Dr. Raphael, um, who's at Texas Children's, has agreed to answer parent questions. Uh, he's also agreed to share some facts with us. So Dr. Raphael, I want to thank you for joining us um, and for being willing to you know, ask questions and to um, provide parents who are listening and also some of our teachers and um, school partners who are listening with um, scientific based information. Uh, we know that there aren't questions, uh, answers to every question, but we appreciate your willingness to, to be here today. Um, so I'm gonna start with a general question. Uh, Tell us how the virus is impacting kids. So can you give us just some of the specifics? What are the number of pediatric infections in Texas, hospitalizations? I hate to say it, but are there pediatric deaths? I mean, what should we know about this virus? So I think the basic thing to understand with kids, it, it, uh, the total numbers, it's only affecting, two, it's only 2% 2 of kids that make up the total number of infections. So what that tells you there is that kids don't tend to be infected in the way that adults do. Um, but that still doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned about our kids because um, our kids could still get it. I think what research is finding is children just tend to have milder forms of the, the condition. So it may just be stuff that looks like a cold or they may be asymptomatic, meaning, meaning that they don't show any signs or symptoms of cough, fever, chest pain, any of that. And so I think that's what the data has shown overall. Um, in terms of pediatric hospitalizations, there are some pediatric hospitalizations, but again, relative to adults, they're really, really low. Um, in terms of pediatric deaths, the numbers are also really low. I don't have the specifics uh, with me, but the numbers are low. I think what's come out that's been concerning in the last month or so is there's a specific sort of form of um, coronavirus with kids, which people are calling multi-inflammatory uh, syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so multiple so multiple organs are affected where it could be there may be some uh, impact on the heart, on the lungs. And so the way they describe this is these are kids who are positive for coronavirus. They also have fever and they also have more than one organ affected. So it may be the heart or may they have diarrhea and it's it's very severe um, and requiring hospitalization. So that's just been a subset of children who've gotten coronavirus. So initially people, felt very reassured by the overall numbers that kids weren't being affected in the same numbers. But then just over the last month with this multi-inflammatory syndrome, people have been a little bit more concerned that, you know, again, there's a small subset of children. I want to emphasize it truly is small, small subset of children who go on to get this. And so I think that has raised a little bit more vigilance in the last month about children. 
Yep. So we have an early on question. Usually it takes, um, I'm looking at, we're only five minutes in. Usually it takes parents about 15 minutes to warm up. So um, Lucy just asked a question. Do you have specific recommendations for children who are themselves high risk, children with diabetes, asthma, or breathing issues? And we hear this from a lot of parents who are concerned, again, about as we're opening our states, um, you know, should we be concerned more concerned about kids who have um, other kinds of risk factors? Yes, so I think that's a question that comes up all the time. And it's the same with adults. So with coronavirus, we worry about people who have underlying conditions like asthma, like diabetes, with adults, hypertension, um, heart disease. Um, and so with, with children, I think it's just a matter of taking more precaution, You know, doing all the things that we talk about, hand hygiene, so washing the hands, uh, mm -hmm. physical distancing um, and wearing masks and just making sure that we do that when we're out in public and um, just taking extra precaution with those kids. And so I wouldn't completely change their lives, but it just, again, it's just to be a, an awareness, uh, just to be more uh, vigilant in what you do with those children. Um, so so you had, you, you mentioned this idea of kids being asymptomatic or maybe having a cold. And for, as a parent myself, I remember when my kids were little, they always had runny noses and they're, you know, and, and so I think the other concern, we have lots of um, grandparents or aunts or community members who are watching other kids and lots of times mm -hmm. parents and families come together. So the concern is also, are the are kids these asymptomatic infectors? Um, you know, I remember when they first closed school and my nine-year-old was really sad. She missed her friends. And I sort of said to her, and I kind of wish I didn't, well, you can get all these people sick, so you have to stay home. And so I'm wondering, and I think a lot of parents felt that that was the case. Is that what um, the science is sort of telling us? Are kids really these asymptomatic kind of super spreaders? Right. So that's gone back and forth. So I remember, you know, you're right. When the schools first closed down, I think we were all telling our kids that. <laughs> um, and so I think they're still collecting a lot more data on kids, not only, you know, around the world, but specifically in the United States to try to be able to tell. I think people have gone away from that um, from where they were a couple months ago and saying these kids are these super spreaders. Um, but again, that doesn't change things in the sense that they should all be taking these precautions. And I think to this point as well about, you know, kids having, you know, maybe a cough, a little something here and there that all of us as parents would usually just say, okay, great, take some Motrin and we'll talk later and just see how you're doing. I think this is a time to really make use of your pediatrician and to take your child in to be seen. Because again, sometimes there, there are these mild symptoms that just need to be, you know, checked on um, by a medical profession. So really take advantage of having a pediatrician. So, so I'm just gonna say it uh, because we've heard it. So what you're saying is it is safe to go to the pediatrician. Absolutely. So if you go to your pediatrician, if the experience is going to be a little bit different because of all the precautions in place. So one thing that pediatricians are doing now frequently is they're using telemedicine. They've done, they're doing uh, video visits. And mm -hmm. so you can call your local clinic, your local pediatrician and see, do, are those available? And so for some people, they feel very comfortable doing that. And your pediatrician will see you by video and, you know, they'll ask you all the questions they usually do. And then that's one option. Other options, you could physically go in to see your pediatrician. And one of the precautions we've taken is what we try to do is separate the visit. So what we may say is on a Monday morning, uh, we'll just see well child visits. Um, just yeah. to make sure that we're keeping well children away from kids who are sick or who have fever. And so that is something you can talk to your pediatrician's office about is say, you know, for example, if you say, hey, I want my child seen for a well child, do you have any procedures in place to do that? And they could talk about what they're doing. And then they may put sick kids, you know, in the afternoon, for example, just again, to keep some separation from those who are well versus those who are sick. And when you call your pediatrician's office, they'll go through the screening questions for coronavirus and if there's any concern, because the last thing we want to do is put other families at risk, put physicians, nurses, other staff at risk, is then they'll convert your visit to video um, just to make sure everyone has a, appropriate safety. 
So, so when you talk about well child visits, you're really talking about those visits that are those regular annual checkups. And they're really frequent when kids are little, usually that zero to kind of 11 ish age. Um, and I know teenagers are supposed to go. I have a teenager. He says he doesn't need to go ever to the pediatrician anymore, but you know, um, but so those involve things like vaccinations, um, weight, height, all of those kind of regular checkups to make sure kids are healthy and progressing. Um, how are we doing in terms of well child visits? Because we did have offices that were closed. Um, what are we seeing in terms of, and, and what are some things parents need to maybe be thinking about? Sure, so I think the concerning thing is what we've seen over the last couple of months is that the number of visits to pediatricians offices have plummeted. Mm -hmm. which means the number of vaccinations have also plummeted as well. And what we're really trying to encourage people to do is to come back to their see their pediatricians because it's vital for vaccines um, because then we worry about kids getting behind on their schedules for the vaccines they need for school, for sports, and just overall, just from a public health standpoint. The last thing we would want to do is get into a situation where we get past coronavirus but then we have outbreaks of all these other um, diseases because kids haven't been properly vaccinated. And so I think one of the biggest messages I can give is for parents to feel safe and comfortable in bringing their kids back to get their vaccinations. I think for kids with underlying conditions like asthma, like diabetes, it's also important. So I know parents feel scared, but it's really important to bring your kids back just to make sure that there is appropriate care being taken for all those conditions as well. And I think the last thing I would say um, to parents is if you think about it now, we're all in this new territory of social distancing where our kids at home all the time. So I think there are these mental health issues we wanna make sure we don't miss as well. So we wanna bring the kids in to be able to be seen to see how they're doing because I think there's some some things you can do as a parent, but I think you know pediatricians also vital for that. And then just making sure children are on task for their developmental milestones as well. So it's about vaccines. It's about just routine well child care. If kids have chronic conditions, we want to see them for that. But then there's also this mental health uh, component that we also want to see kids for. Yeah. So I think this idea of, you know, getting to the pediatrician is really, really important and recognizing that parents, what I'm hearing you say is uh, pedi pediatrician's offices are setting up systems so that it is safer for those visits to happen. And as a former teacher myself, I can say the thought of going into a classroom on top of like with the COVID challenge is one thing. And then to walk into a classroom with kids who may not have the up to date on, you know, measles, mumps, whooping cough, those other kinds of diseases that are preventable. Um, it, it sounds like that's that's important. So we've got a, um, a note from Samia, who said, um, she joined a few minutes late, so welcome, Samia, glad to have your um, comment. She'd love to get your input on school opening. It's the big million dollar question. Districts are exploring hybrid classroom, online courses extended, 11 months year. What are your thoughts on the best way to take precautions? Um, and then we'll get to her second question, which is another really big issue that's come up. Sure. So in terms of school openings, I think it's still a wide open question. All school districts are working uh, around it. And so I think the question that schools are trying to figure out, are what is the right number of kids to have in a classroom? So, you know, you think of historically the days where you have these packed cafeterias, you have these packed buses as well. And mm -hmm. with in the era of coronavirus, we just can't have that. So then it's trying to think about what's the way to have kids come into school physically um, and not and not raise all these safety concerns. So I think the numbers will be smaller because what schools may do is just have certain days. So they may say an A day is where your child comes into school and the B day is where your child is at home learning virtually. So maybe days are broken up or weeks are broken up. And I think those are all the um, sort of guidelines that people are going through in terms of how to do that. I think busing is a big issue um, in all of that, especially for people who have multiple children. So I have three kids and trying to think about who's A day, who's B day, and who's on the bus, who's at home, do I have childcare? All of that is, I think, all the considerations the school systems are making right now. So I think they're still in their planning stages. Again, I think it will be a combination where there's some in-person schooling and some virtual learning as well. Um, and then I think some extension of the school year to try to get the hours in that uh, students need. 
Yeah, I mean, so so it's really tough, right? Because parents are in and schools are in this really strange place where you're having the, to balance health and safety and and life and death. And also what I would say is reading is life and death, right? I mean, you, you learning to read and learning to do math and it, it opens up opportunities and doors and independence as an adult. And so, you know, we're worried about learning loss. We're worrying about social isolation um, and we're learning, worrying about, you know, sort of containing the spread of, of COVID and making sure that people are, are safe. And I think this, the issue of, um, crowd schools being really crowded is is a big challenge um and different depending on the ages i mean again i've talked about i have a high schooler and i think about the hallways in the school right and just the passing periods um as opposed to a self-contained classroom um one other question that has come up a lot and samia brought this up is uh, during the summer what types of activities and camps are safe so really specifically we've opened playgrounds um we're opening up community pools um, kids are starting to come out and sort of play with each other in small groups. And again, we're, we're balancing as parents the mental well-being, right? We want our kids to be physical, to get fresh air, to be outside. Um, we want them also to play with their peers and to have interaction. But how safe are these things for our children? Right. I think the, the best strategy is to really, you know, kind of go back to what, you know, the focus has to be on the social distancing, the masking hand hygiene. So if you're at the pool, you know, if your child's not in the pool, they should be wearing a mask. Obviously in the pool, they should not be wearing a mask at all. <laughs> um, um, and just making sure again, they're six feet apart from other other children and adults. And so, and then when they're, before they go into the pool, they're washing their hands and that people aren't sharing water bottles, aren't sharing food. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just taking the precautions that we're, we're emphasizing and promoting in general and just taking them into those spaces. I think what a lot of camps are doing, they're limiting the number of participants in their programs to really try to manage some of the safety issues. And so I think for parents, it's just a number of choices. And you said it best is you have to sort of weigh, you know, the mental health aspects of it and being with your peers and friends, um, but also understanding the safety parts of it too. So I think as a parent, the best things to do is when you're thinking about these camps that may be open, just ask them what procedures they're taking to ensure safety for the children. And then also thinking, you know, something like tennis is going to be much easier to do because there's already a distance versus other things like summer basketball. And so really, again, just talking, I know, I know, it's hard to imagine. Oh, I my 15 year old plays on a basketball in high school. is like, he's probably right, like, right. I'm off the program, mom. Yes, exactly, exactly. Everyone's learning to play tennis now. So, so it's just really thinking about what your kids enjoy doing and can those things, those experiences be modified from the summer camps. But it, it, again, it's a situation all of us as parents are constantly thinking about and trying to weigh, you know, the social interaction just from just the viral risk. Yeah, these are really tough questions. And it feels like as parents, we're going to be kind of put to the test to make these tough decisions because things like, UIL um, sports, right? So again, there's football is opening up and we're, we're in Texas, right? So this question of, you know, is my kid, you know, for there's football, there's there's also band, right? Those kinds of things and, um, and, and kids, it's very hard because social distancing is something the teacher's gonna have to start to enforce. Um, and parents are going to need to talk. Oh, Samia's uh, son is playing tennis, so she's a lucky one. I have a football <laughs> and a basketball player, so not so lucky for me. Soccer's another good one. You can actually, when they're older, and they're, you know. But I, I think the pool thing is another really big one as we're looking at days that are 100 degrees and public pools are opening. So good to know that you can go, but what you should be doing is staying distanced, uh, so families just staying together, and then not wearing a mask while you're in the water because that leads that leads to drowning and other kinds of, of uh, issues, right? So this is also a big drowning season. So um, as we think about, you know, kids, teenagers watching other kids, I think as parents go back to work and some of our summer camps have been canceled, um, you know, there are kids watching kids and neighbors watching kids. And, and so these are really important tips. I, I'd like to ask a question. Um, so we're, we've heard a lot of, um, 
that about COVID-19 disproportionately impacting communities of color. Um, and I know that you've done some research um, around this, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about this. And is it also, is this also true for kids? So if it is true uh, that COVID-19 is disproportionately uh, affecting um, communities of color, is that also true for, for pediatric patients? So when um, the data started coming out about COVID, I think sometime maybe in March, there was this concern that it disproportionately affected people who were you know, African-American, Hispanic. And I think the original question was, well, is it something biological that somehow it predisposes to those populations? And I think over time, what we've really seen is just that the underlying inequities that were already there. So you know, with these populations, a lot of them uh, tend to live in densely packed areas, urban areas, um, you know, Hispanic families and African American families also tend to have a higher proportion of families who live in multi generational houses. So that include grandparents, aunts, uncles, and in those situations, it's harder to social distance. And so yeah. then you may be at a little bit higher risk because of that. Access to care uh, is an issue in in these families as well. So if you look at communities of color, they tend to have lower. Um, lower rates of health insurance. And so if they're having minimal symptoms, if they're having moderate symptoms, they don't have access to care in the ways that others do. And so that puts them at greater risk because by the time they end up in the healthcare system, they may be further down with more complications, but also they may be infecting others um, while their care is sort of foregone. I think the other thing I would mention too is in um, there's a higher number of people in communities of color who are essential workers. So grocery store, uh, think of meatpacking industry, and all those places that are opening up. So as the economy is opening up, a lot of those individuals are much more exposed uh, to COVID than others. And so when you think about their kids, that means their kids are going to be exposed as well. And so again, it goes back to the public health message of just the hand washing, you know, the mask wearing and social distancing, but it's hard to do some of those things in these communities. Yeah, I think I think as you raise the issue around service industry, so lots of families that we um, we serve at Families Empowered are considered essential workers and work in the service industry, right? And so as we think about schools opening, and Carol had a comment as a retired teacher, she can't imagine how teachers are going to deal with this, but I think to parents. Um, you know, if you're a service industry worker, it's very hard to say, well, I'll wait tables on Monday and Wednesday, but not, you know, Tuesday, Thursday. Um, or if you are cleaning an office building, um, you know, or so So, what's tough is, um, you know, again, we, we've got a lot of really difficult trade-offs we're going to have to make. Um, we serve lots of grandparents. Um, so there are lots of, as you said, like extended families that are living together. So kids, parents, grandparents. Um, and as people have been displaced, um, I think, and as we start uh, evictions, maybe start moving forward, we're very concerned about that becoming even sort of more pronounced. Um, so again, I'm hearing hand washing, which by the way, we should all be doing anyway. I now love soap more than ever. So soap, basic soap and water, right? Like white ivory dial soap basic soap works. Um, masking. So let's talk about masking. Um, everybody, should kids be wearing masks? Yeah, so the recommendation is that kids two, above two years of age should be wearing masks. Um, so if you're in a public setting, if you're in a grocery store, or you're you know, somewhere else, I think the only places we talk about wearing the mask, taking the mask off is if you're out exercising or if you're eating. And so those are sort of the areas and times where you wouldn't be wearing a mask, but otherwise they should be wearing a mask. And I think the thing, there's a lot of confusion about masks because people think, oh, if I wear a mask, I'm not going to get it. And people don't realize when you wear a mask, you're actually protecting other people from yourself. And so when, again, when we think about these questions about essential workers and people say, oh, I should be able to go anywhere and not wear a mask, you're actually putting those essential workers at risk because with by you not wearing a mask, you're you're increasing their chances of getting uh, COVID nineteen. So when we're out and we're not exercising and we're going to the store, uh, we're picking up a prescription. Um, we ought to be wearing masks. A hundred percent, yes, yes. Okay. Adults, children, all of us. Again, not children under two years of age, um, but kids who are older should be wearing masks. And when we're outside, uh, if you're riding a bike 
if you're going for a run, maybe maybe that's the time when you can be mindful about not wearing it or in a pool. But other than that, every other time on your face. Correct? Yes, absolutely. And I think as a parent, there, there are some practical things you could do. Like what I do is I just leave extra masks in the car because inevitably, you know, kids forget them. And then you get to the grocery store and you say, everybody put on your mask. And then two out of three of my kids will say, uh, oh, mine's it up in my room. And yeah. So what I've done is just, you know, just have them stored away. So it's never an issue. Yeah, it's like when you get older and you wear readers, reading glasses, you just have to have them tucked all over the place. So this is what we need to start doing with masks, right? It's just, just right. if you have a few. And the good news is I'm seeing more and more masks. You can actually get them now. Um, and so um, we have this other question related a little bit to masks. Um, what are your thoughts on wearing those face shields for kids at school? And part of... Um, that question I think is interesting um, as a, a former teacher, but also hearing from um, teachers, especially who have the littles, you know, and um, kids respond to smiles, you know, or sometimes the mean look, like the I'm serious, we need to be quiet, you know. And when you can't see someone's face, um, I think as teachers, or if I can't see a child's face, um, if I'm doing speech pathology and I need to see the formation of the mouth or I'm teaching reading, I think there's a thought that maybe those clear face shields um, would also help with like snacks. Little kids eat snacks sometimes in school. Um, what are your thoughts on those? Uh, is, is that just sort of a, we want to see each other we, and, and are, are they as helpful or not? I would, I would, I mean, I think we should stick to masks. I think, you know, when you talk about face shields, there's also a supply issue in terms of medical professionals needing those. And so wow. to start thinking about using them as, you know, the general public would create concern along those lines. But I think masks have been proven to work. Yeah. And I think when you're talking about face shields, there are going to be other issues of kids getting them on, hitting each other with them, and yeah. they may not be safe in the way that they're using them. So I, I think the best thing to do is just stick with what we have. And it just means that you know, just as have we, we've had to adapt in a number of other ways with um, COVID-19, you know, I think with schooling and just all the interactions, it may be more, you know, exaggerated hand gestures or, you know, kids pay attention more to the words that the teachers are wow. saying. It is, and again, it's unfortunate. This is not the ideal situation, but I think it's just what's required until there is a vaccine. So, um, and I will just say to Linda, um, I know that the, the Houston Chronicle uh, yesterday, J Jacob Carpenter uh, had an article in the Houston Chronicle focused on the issue of PPE equipment for schools. So this is an issue, right? And the state is purchasing uh, PPE and cl like um, cleaning supplies for schools. Um, and, and they'll be distributing that based on enrollment. Um, districts can reject that, but it sounds to me like Dr. Raphael is saying, take the masks. We should have those masks and we should have them in the classrooms and we should have them at the front desk. Um, and I do think for parents, it's also going to mean there are probably a lot of different procedures schools are going to implement in terms of parents visiting, having lunch, coming in. Um, you know, we've had security, but now we'll probably have you know, essential visits and non-essential visits and, and things like like that. Um, Dr. Raphael, you mentioned a, a vaccine. So I think as we come on to the 30 minute mark, I'd love for you to talk to the, the folks, the, the parents and the um, community members who are listening. So is a vaccine realistic? Um, you know, and if yes, where where do kids fall in line for a vaccine? Are they first in line? Are they last in line? Like, what do, what what should we be thinking about a vaccine? So a vaccine is 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 very important because that you know right now we're using all these things, masking, social distancing, hand hand washing to really kind of get us by. And what we're really hoping to get to the point is where we have a vaccine. So if you think about a vaccine, just like the flu vaccine that we take uh, yearly. Um, that would sort of be the, the long term of what we're hoping for. And so there are all these vaccines in development for COVID-19. It's just a matter of when they'll be ready. So what people don't understand is the typical time for a vaccine to you know, do all the necessary research and get to the point where it could be given out in mass distribution is about five years. And wow. we're, trying to, we're trying to do all of this within yeah. a very short period of time. And 
I think we're, we're getting there. And there's been some talk that a vaccine may be available by the end of the year or early next year. I think originally people were saying 18 months, um, but the timeline keeps changing in a, in a positive way. And so I think, yeah, that's good. That's our, our good news. And so I think what we have to see is how responsive we'll all be to the vaccine, adults and children as well. You know, just with the flu vaccine, some years the flu vaccine is great, some, uh, some years it's not as good. And so it's just gonna be continually just assessing, you know, how good is, how good is the vaccine? But there's research that's going to be done on adults. There's research that'll be done on children. Sometimes with children, we don't do as much uh, research just because of just timing and trying to get something out to the general public. Um, but there will be research done uh, regardless. It's just a matter of when the timing of all of that will be. So I think vaccination is sort of where we all want to be yeah. for both adults and kids. So that's really good news to hear research looks positive uh, and the timeline looks maybe shorter than we had originally anticipated. Um, and, and there's finding a vaccine and then there's producing and distributing uh, that vaccine. And, it's, and, and I guess the other question folks have is sort of, is if, if we're talking about distribution, we're talking about a global distribution because this is not just affecting you know, Texans and folks in in the US, it's affecting everyone. Um, and so it sounds like there might also be a prioritization of essential workers or healthcare professionals or um, maybe even teachers, right? So that you're thinking about who who really is a front or an essential worker, who's on the front lines. Um, um, and maybe someone like me um, is sort of somewhere in the middle in terms of receiving a vaccine, right? I, I don't know. You might need one more than me. And we all. <laughs> But hopefully, you know, I think the hope is that and the goal will be that everyone should be able to get a vaccine. Um, that is not the type of thing where we're going to have to ration it and say, OK, we'll start with these. It may be that we start with certain people versus others. But I think the goal is that everyone would in a very swift uh, time period have access to a vaccine. Yeah, it's sort of like we all get polio vaccines. We all get polio MR. Right. Um, and so what are... Are there treatments? I mean, so talk to us a little bit about treatments, because what we are hearing about, and then I've got some some questions about testing, but I think treatment is another question, which is, if I get, we get this, if I get COVID, am I going to die? Is there, there, we were hearing for a long time, there's no treatment, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do, you have to stay in, in your home. Is, is that true? Um, you know, what are we learning about treatment? Yeah, so as far as treatment, you know, um, there have been a couple of drugs people have been looking at. One is hydrochloroquine, uh, which people started taking, unfortunately, before there was any evidence about whether it worked or not. And there were, you know, there were some poisonings that were happening, even, you know, some severe cases. And so I think the data has shown that that doesn't, that doesn't work um, in terms of treating someone who does have uh, COVID-19. Um, there is another medication, I always forget how to pronounce it, like, I think it's remdesivir. And that medication has shown some um, effectiveness in treating mm -hmm. people who do have it. The thing right now is it's in short supply. Um, yeah. And so, you know, people are having to figure out who should uh, get it versus others. Um, they're also using it in children as well. Um, and so I think it's important to know that there are there is treatment out there, but again, it's gonna come down to long-term and having vaccination because that's what really want it's just to have overall immunity within our communities. And so, yes, it's a positive step, but it's just a part of the picture. The big thing what we want is to be able to knock it out completely. So it, so, so it sounds like um, until we have a vaccination, the message is we're all going to have to accept that we're going to have to change our behavior mm -hmm. a, little, Absolutely. a little bit. We'll have to make some health modifications to our behaviors. Um, and and avoiding avoiding the doctor is not one of them. No, no, come in to see us. And again, the procedures are there. People get their temperatures checked in as they're being screened to walking to the door. We make the environment, the experience as safe as possible. I've taken my own children uh, to the doctor in the last uh, week. And I can tell you when you get in, everyone's getting screened. They're getting questions that they're, they have to answer. They're getting their temperatures checked. And then assuming they pass all those, they're being given a mask. Everyone in the family is being given a mask before even coming into a clinic, a hospital setting. So 
there are a lot of precautions taking, taken to make sure everyone's safe. Um, so one of the, the last questions we, we get, I have, um, is around uh, isolation and mental health. So I, I do think that um, there's been a lot of discussion about mental health but with adults. Um, but I just, you know, as, as a as a parent myself, I, I think this has been really hard on my own kids. Um, and um, I wonder about both the mental health of little kids, but also teenagers um, and the amount of screen time, video gaming, and social media. Um, are you all seeing any, um, you know, sort of uptick in, in mental health treatment for, for kids during this time? Or do you have any advice for fam parents? So I think, you know, what we're seeing so far is I think this crisis, this pandemic is probably exacerbates underlying mental health concerns that were there with, you know, adolescents, younger children already, but also creating new ones because now you have all this social isolation, you know, kids aren't seeing their friends, they're missing graduations that, you know, they had planned on and those things didn't happen. They're celebrating their birthdays, but they're celebrating them differently. And so I think as parents, what we have to try to do is try to figure out ways that we can try to still have those experiences in terms of part, uh, parties, celebrations. They may be virtual, they may be outside with social distancing, just to try to get our kids some sense of normalcy. I think you, know, you made another great point just about all the gaming and the social media, because now if kids are at home predominantly, there's a lot of time spent in rooms, alone, on Netflix, doing all these other things. So I think as parents, we just have to be really engaged and just, you know, going up to your kid's room and saying, hey, what are you doing? Can I watch with you? Or, you know, what have you been up to? Because I think that just increases the isolation if they're just up in their rooms on all these different platforms and we don't, we're not even sure what these platforms are. So I think mental health is a huge, huge issue. And it's not like there's data to say, this is what mental health looks like for children and adolescents during a pandemic. So we have no idea. So I think we can't even assume that our kids are doing well. And so I think it really requires a lot of conversation with our children just to get a sense of where they are. And then again, just trying to create opportunities for normalcy. So, so before we um, before we wrap up, I I want to um, just make sure um, we have some good clear messages. So the, the the questions we're getting for parent from parents are these really broad based questions. Is my child safe? To, is it safe for my child to go back to school? And I think you and I were on a call with the superintendent from McAllen ISD down in the valley. Um, and they did a survey where, you know, 50% of their parents said, yes, I want to send my kid back. I bet those had, those were teenage parents of teenagers. <laughs> and, and um, you know, or, or maybe really little kids. And um, I don't know. Uh, and 40% said, no, I, I'm not comfortable. And 10% said, mm, I don't know. And I think, you know, those are probably parents who are thinking, I, I need to know what's going to happen. Um, and I, I think 50% feels right to me. I mean, as a parent who's a working mom myself, I, I think we have combined custodial care and schools. So it's very hard to work and not send your child to a physical location, right? And I think for some people, they may be saying, well, I'm unemployed now. Maybe I'll just hold off until there's a vaccine and I'll just stay home and, and you know, um, and or my business is closed or we'll just make it work. Um, and then 10 percent are sort of saying, I, I don't know. A family is empowered. Uh, we did a we're conducting a survey right now asking that same question um, because, you know, school districts are trying to figure this out. But it's really parents saying, is my kid going to be safe? Um, and what are the questions I should be asking as a parent, the school? So, so when I go to the school, uh, we have parents who come to us, they're looking for options. They're either first time, like kind of first time parents who are saying, this is my first pre-K, my first kinder. They're switching from a middle, elementary school to a middle school. They're looking for high school or they're recently moved. We, we actually serve a lot of refugee families who've come here, um, or they had some issue, their kid was bullied, they were having a, a not great experience. Um, the question parents are asking as they're considering re-enrolling is, 
is my kid safe? And we've been thinking maybe we need to be providing parents with a checklist of more specific questions to ask. Um, and so what might some of those specific questions be? And then we, we've got one more, I think. So I think, I think questions I would, I would have as a parent and just thinking about it from the perspective of a, a medical professional and public health person is just, you know, what is, what, what is a class size going to look like? You know, will kids be put apart in terms of desks? Will there be uh, empty desks between multiple desks? What, mm -hmm. will, what will the new classroom look like? Uh, I would want to know what will your cafeteria situation look like as well for my child? How will we do lunches now? How will we actually do recess? You know, because if you think about all the equipment that kids love playing with or just the games that they love during recess, can can that be modified? What will that look like? And then, you know, there's also just the buses as well. You know, how many kids can you fit on a bus and how will they be organized on the bus as well? Are they going to be wearing masks? Are they not going to be wearing masks? So there are so many questions. And I think that's where all these school systems are really focusing their attention right now because there's so much detail that has to be sorted out before you can even present it to a family. And just, you know, just to give you an example, just even in the hospital, you know, now we're limiting elevators to four people um, per elevator. So there are all these very basic questions that you can't even anticipate in some of them until you actually go through them. And wow. so now if only four people are on an elevator, that means everything's gonna be much slower. Um, so and just imagine some of those kind of questions in the school setting and how what, what's being impacted. Wow, and I've been to the Texas Children's Tower downtown mm -hmm. with my, my daughter actually a couple times and between the parking garage and then the elevator when you get up to your floor, that's that's actually logistically a, a tough, a tough thing. So I, I think you're giving me an idea that we ought to have a, a good checklist that we could, if a parent asks, that maybe we can send to them and say, hey, here are some of the questions you might want to get some, some clarity on. We have another question from Deanna that says, oh, and she has college students. Is it safe for college students to go to college on campus? And again, you know. Seniors who've just graduated or kids who've worked so hard to get into college are now having to face a decision that's pretty tough. So what would you say to parents who are about to send their kids to go live on in a dorm on campus? I think I think it goes back to what you were saying before, you know, having a checklist of questions because you know, if you think about the typical college experience, and for some families, this may be their first college experience, so they don't even know the questions to ask. You know, in terms of dorms, sometimes dorms have, you know, roommates, um, two people in a suite, or four people in a suite, or two people sharing, you know, basically the same room. And how do you do, how do you manage that? Or can you even do that? Do the colleges have the capacity to actually room the, the kids in another way? And then again, when you think about places to eat, so their cafeterias, uh, the libraries, what are gonna be the procedures around masking and how do you go to class and will it be mostly virtual? And you know, so I think the colleges are also trying to figure out these questions because you know, we think about these school systems, but then when you add colleges that just have, you know, again, you think about these classic pictures you see of colleges where there are all these kids packed into dorms and parties and classrooms and all of that. And they just can't, they can't proceed like that in uh, the midst of a pandemic. So colleges, just like elementary schools and high schools have to rethink a lot of their procedures and how things are organized. And that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a heavy lift. And I think that's why some colleges have just deferred um, some of that to January by saying, you know, we'll have, we'll, yeah. we'll be all virtual until January or indefinitely just because the questions are so big in terms of how to do it, but there may be other colleges or campuses, just the way that they're organized can maybe do in person. Yeah. Um, but again, it's a tough one. I'm having this this moment of thinking like, when I look at your resume and I'm so impressed with your academic resume, I'm like, oh, I bet you were much more serious in college than I think <laughs> I was. Because when I think about college, I think about this very social experience to your point about you know going out and I and I'm sure you were pretty social too. But I but there there are these like 
you know, these, you figure out kind of these relationships and there are clubs and there are things that you do. And then there's, you know, going out, there's parties, there's fraternal organizations. Um, and these are young adults. They're still, they're not quite pediatric patients, but they're not really adults, right? They're in that. And they have these frontal lobe logic challenges. Um, maybe boys more than girls. I don't know. Um, I have a, a boy. So I think, is that going to develop by the time he gets to college and, um, you know, and there's not sometimes the best social decision making because there's not a fear of, of dying, of, of mortality, right? And, and these are really, I think having the checklist is important. Samia also asked, and Samia, thank you very much. That, um, that you definitely have a school age kid. What are you seeing about COVID children? Um, how is it more dangerous for people with pre existing? You asked this at the top of the hour. Um, I think as we close, it's a good way for people who couldn't join us to maybe just you know reiterate. Um, and again, we've got families with kids with asthma, cystic fibrosis, um, pre diabetes, and those might even be the the forty percent or ten percent that are saying, "Okay, my my child doesn't has a chronic condition. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, can be life threatening." asthma is life-threatening, diabetes is life-threatening, cystic fibrosis. So, you know, uh, I guess this is, again, how is it affecting those kids and is it more dangerous for them? So for those kids, it's definitely more concerning just because they do have underlying conditions that could, you know, make them more susceptible to complications from COVID-19. I think the, the best things to do are, one, is to stick to the public health measures that we keep talking about, the hand yeah. washing, the social distancing, the mask wearing, but I think second is really making sure they're seeing not only their pediatricians, but their subspecialists. Um, so if you're being seen, if you, your child has diabetes, they should be seen by their endocrinologist because the last thing we wanna do is to forego the basic treatment for some of these conditions because we're so scared to go into offices and hospitals and clinics, because then that means the asthma will get worse. It means the diabetes may get out of control and so I think I, if I can give any message to parents is really, this is a time to really talk and partner with your pediatricians and the subspecialists for your children, if they do have those conditions, because they can have more, you know, more specific messages or advice on what to do with those children. And I think it's just an opportunity to have your, your questions answered in a pretty thoughtful way, but don't forego the care that they need for all the, the basics of whatever those conditions are, because that's pretty important. And then, um, for parents, and you may not have this answer, so we, we might have to look this up. Um, but you, you know, for families that don't have insurance, um, you know, we had also we were going to have um, someone from Legacy Health um, Clinic come today, but pediatricians' offices are opening, so uh, they're they're kind of trying to see as many kids as possible. Um, so I, you know, I think the other thing that we've been thinking about is, you know, some of our schools have partnered with groups like Legacy, and they built clinics into the schools. And so it's one more reason, um, you know, that we think, well, we really want schools to open because, you know, in that case, we need kids to, to see physicians. But for families who don't have insurance, um, you know, are there any, like sort of public health um, organizations that you would recommend they contact that we can, you know, share with our, our parents? I think one place I'd look is definitely the Houston Health Department. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't have a specific contact uh, information right now, but I would say, you know, look towards your local government um, for options about testing sites all over uh, the county, Harris County, um, because, you know, there will be options for, um, for individuals who don't have insurance. I, I would say the other thing too is there may be people who don't have health insurance, but they're eligible for health insurance. So, you know, not just to assume because I don't have health insurance, I can't get it, is yeah. to actually um, to look again um, online or from other sources to see if you're eligible. Because the last thing we want to do during this time is forego care when we could have access to care. So I would say the two messages would be look towards your health department to see what those options are. Um, there are a number of federally qualified health care centers where, you know, there may be uh, testing available for those who are uninsured. Um, and then also, again, look to your public health department. 
Okay, one one last question, and uh, Shri said this information is good. Shri, I'm glad that this information was great. I know that you have um, two beautiful grandchildren, and I also know that you have a daughter who is a teacher in Mississippi. So I'm very pleased to see this, and I hope you're sharing it with them, and, and that I, I hope Jennifer shares it with her students. Um, so one quick question about testing. Yesterday, I heard from a mom friend, well, we're not testing anybody. Like, we don't have enough tests. And so two questions. Um, we, what's the deal with testing in Texas um, and, and also um, testing kids? So when we see these test numbers go up, are the, does that also include kids? Is it all folks? I mean, you know, how, how are we in terms of testing kids versus adults? Sure. So, you know, there, you know, when this whole thing started, there was a big limitation on the number of tests that were available to be done. They took a long time. So sometimes it took as, uh, as many as seven to 10 days to even come back. People didn't yeah. know where to get the test. There was a lot of concern about safety, about going into your doctor's office and expo being exposed to risk. Um, just to get testing. And so now where things are with testing are much better. There are, you know, many more sites, there are drive-through testing sites where people can go. Um, if, you know, if you go to your doctor's office and they determine that you need testing, you could get it done there or they can send you, reroute you to, a, um, to other sites that may be closer to where you live. So you actually don't even have to come in. Um, kids are being tested, absolutely. We've tested a ton of uh, children at Texas yeah. Children's Hospital and that's going on across the board. So there should not be limitations in testing right now. Yeah. Um, and I think the big thing to understand is, but it has to be you know, based on whether or not you're having symptoms and the concerning um, exposures. So if I have a child who has some symptoms or I as a parent have symptoms, I think what I heard um, in this discussion is I could set up a telemedicine visit discuss my symptoms and would a pediatrician or my physician um, be able to direct me to a testing site over a telemedicine visit or would I have to go into the office? Could I do both is the question, I guess. Sure, so what happens is when you first call in, you'll be screened by phone because the last thing we would wanna do is bring someone in to a clinic setting who we think could be positive and yeah. risk, you put, put other families and children at risk and so, once we do that screening, we may determine, okay, this would be a great telemedicine visit. We'll set up a time, we'll talk. And then if it seems like you should be tested, the options could be either or, that you would come into that site with appropriate masking and everyone else wearing appropriate masking for you to get tested. Or you can go through one of these drive-through centers where you can get testing done there as well as an alternative. But again, it's always going to be safe in the way that we do it. And that's why we try to collect all that information before someone even shows up to a clinic because we don't wanna put other families, staff uh, or physicians, nurses at risk. Um, this is this is uh, really great. And I, you know, seeing someone else say thank you for doing this. And so um, who I also know works at um, Houston Community College. So it's, See some of these people keep popping up. So very, um, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today and to share this information. Um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, um, and and our families love their children very much and want them to have you know to be safe and to have full happy lives. And parents are really are really faced with tough decisions right now. Um, and my big takeaway from getting to know you through Children at Risk, and I have to just give a shout out to, to Dr. Bob Sanborn for pulling people together. He's just so great and such a great child advocate. Um, my big takeaway was, you know, our pediatricians matter, and we should be we should be as parents um, relying on pediatricians who actually have um, the science and know the data and have our kids' best interest at heart. Um, we should be going to our well visits um, so that our kids are safe from preventable diseases and um, and that we are we are also taking care of pre-existing conditions um, before we go back to school because what we want is our kids to be in the healthiest position they can be in in August um, when they go back to school and then we need to put together this checklist of things to ask if you're if you're really stressed out but I appreciate all these parents saying uh, thank you and uh, Dr. Raphael we are so grateful to you um, and to all the other doctors um, at Texas Children's who are working kind of around the clock um, to keep our kids safe.
So appreciate you very, very much. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to come back anytime. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.